Men are good, as are you. Men are indeed good, as is Janice Fiamingo, one of my favorite <laughs> men's advocates. I'm telling you, I think she's a beautiful woman in a, with a man's mind. Anyway, um, we are here today very excitedly with Rick Bradford. Now, Rick, for those of you who don't know, wrote a book called The Empathy Gap. It is an amazing book, just filled with fascinating information. And he wrote it under the pen name of William Collins. But today we're going to be talking to the real Rick Bradford about all kinds of things. And Rick gave a, um, a presentation at the last ICMI on moral usurpation. And it's a fascinating presentation. We were going to try and talk a little bit about it today. And I've learned so much from this presentation and from the empathy gap that I'm just excited to have Rick here with us. Anyway, Rick, one of the things you started off with was you talked about, um, how did you put it, that the are the feminists the useful idiots of the globalists, or are the globalists the useful idiots of the feminists? I thought that was a fascinating way to start. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that was um, that was that was one of the motivations um, for this whole line of thinking. In fact, I had actually planned a talk on moral usurpation for the previous years I see of mine, 2020, yeah. but I, I pulled it at the last moment because I thought it might be a step too far, you know. And so I, I, I swapped it for a more traditional sort of uh, empathy gap type talk mm. that year. Mm. But I thought I'd go for it um, in the last one, last November, uh, Dece December rather. Um, because it's an idea that has taken root in my mind. And um, that issue that you raised there about who's the useful idiot of whom um, is one of the motivations, but there's there's a, probably a couple of others. I mean, the thorny issue that, that is on all of our minds, I would think, is what can we do about these Yes. Um, these issues, the male disadvantages, the empathy gap, feminism, gynocentrism, all that, all of which, by the way, is entirely unaffected by these ideas about moral usurpation. Moral, moral usurpation is perfectly consistent with everything we know and would strongly agree about. But what, what are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And um, in order to, well, if I can put it this way, in order to correctly um, prescribe a treatment for a disease, you've first of all got to diagnose the disease correctly. Now, yes. we've probably diagnosed feminism pretty well via gynocentrism and, and the, the psychological types that tend to lead into feminism. So we, we sort of understand that quite well, but then along came woke. And uh, the, it's, it's as if the the primary tumor has metastasized you know and that hmm. feminism has now given birth and i think i can blame feminism largely for woke yeah. even even though hmm. um the turfs and the the tran the trans lobby don't get on very well um so so there's there's a there's a, another aspect to this disease that we haven't properly understood i mean where is the woke monster coming from and why is that appealing to the elites? Um, but this issue of the elites goes back quite a long way. I mean, I've, I've been worrying about this since 2014. That was when I first looked at the, the global gender gap reports. I don't know if you've ever come mm. across those. Um, yeah. they're, they're basically feminist propaganda, which um, I won't go into the details, but they're just feminist propaganda. But what I realized back in 2014 when I was writing a blog piece on them was that they were financed by the World Economic Forum. Yeah. And this was quite early days in my blogging. I was still sort of going up the learning curve and I hadn't realized just how, how feminist these international organizations like the WEF and the United Nations and the EU were at that stage. But this made me realize that they were. And I asked myself, well, you know, I can understand why national governments may be feminist because 
they have a strong feminist lobby within the parliament and right. and they're concerned about the female vote which is the dominant right. voting lobby and all this right. stuff and of course parliaments and, and governments are full of white knights the male politicians that are frightened of confronting the system so i, so I could understand it in terms of national governments but why were these international bodies that were not subject to those same pressures also so feminist particularly the wef apparently the doyen of international capitalism why would they be bothered so i've been worrying about this since then and um my solution to this problem hinges around the issue of morality and um that may seem a bit of a logical leap, but the the reason the the the, the connection is, is about power, because all these big international bodies and national governments and feminism itself and the woke lobby, they're all concerned about power. I mean, woke is critical theory, really, which is overtly about power. It's a it's critical Marxism, really which is about acquiring power. And um, what I realized is that uh, morality plays a very important role in stabilizing the elite's power. Yeah. And you, you, can, you can see this in history. It's not, um, it's not something that is new, totally new. You can see it, for example, and I think I give this example in the talk, you can see it in things like the divine right of kings. Right. Mm -hmm. That that is to the modern mind that is nothing but a fraud. I mean, it's an obvious fraud, isn't it? Yes. Um, <laughs> why should why should the king who by an accident of birth have a divine right to to be an absolute monarch? But the point is, people at the time believed it. They actually believed it, and you can see this in the historical record. Because back in the medieval period, when the when the peasants were revolting, as they frequently were, <laughs> um, they they were, showed a great reluctance to blame the king himself. They invariably blamed wicked advisers who were misleading him, and they were very reluctant to uh, to blame the king. Uh, it, and it was only it, in the English Revolution when a, that that sort of barrier was broken. A little, let's not get into Puritans and all that. But it made me realise that morality played an important role in stabilising the elite's power. The the point here is, you see, people think of power as being uh, instantiated in things like armies and police forces. In other words, physical power, the threat of force. But it isn't always the case. No. Um, the force is only used as a last resort. It, it, it isn't physical force that um, creates a harmony. You, you see, that I should backtrack a bit and say that morality, I think, is a, an innate psychological proclivity in Homo sapiens. Hmm. And I say that because Homo sapiens have a unique ability in the animal world to form extremely large, harmonious, cooperative societies that are not based on kinship. I don't think there's any other right. examples in the animal kingdom. Right. And I think the what I call the social morality, that is the accepted um, norms of behavior, I think that plays a key role in that. And, and the willingness of people to conform to an agreed set of social norms is an innate proclivity. And it's, it's policed by social emotions like shaming and guilt. Mm. So if you step outside the accepted norms, you will be shamed and you will feel guilty. And that though they are very powerful motivators to make you conform. So morality, this, and specifically the social morality, is a mechanism whereby people police themselves. I think the way I expressed it in the talk was, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Joe Public um, 
are being controlled, but they're not being controlled by a policeman sitting in their front room. Right. They're being controlled by their own minds right. mm -hmm. and by the power of conformance. Okay. So it's, it's, this, it's this willingness to conform to what um, the public perception and your peer group is telling you is the right thing to do. I don't know if I could talk about COVID at this point, couldn't I? Right. Perhaps yes. Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll pause at that point because I've probably waffled on, waffled on enough on that. Well, yeah, that's no, that's what, uh, that's very good, uh, Rick. Thanks. Uh, I, I I was really struck by that your your notion of the significance of social morality as the framework that organizes the way masses of people think yes. about you know what is good, what is acceptable, and that uh, encourages and in fact demands that we all to some extent regulate our own conduct according to that morality, even though in the present case and in the other cases too that you talk about, that social morality is in many ways at odds with common sense, uh, with, with perceived reality, and indeed with, with traditional morality. And so I thought that was right. fascinating that you got into that and, and made the point that the morality that we many of us accept now and that is 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 clearly exploited by these various powerful elites, both in government and, you know, in other groups in society, that morality is not one that is necessarily shared by many other groups in society. And it's certainly not what we would consider traditional morality. And yet it has this very powerful force to organize assent. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the distinction you make between what we would consider sort of um, natural morality um, and and this social morality as it pertains particularly to uh, progressivism, wokeism, and feminism. And I agree with you, by the way, that, that, that wokeism or progressivism, whatever you want to call it, it does come directly from feminism. Yes. And it's there, if you look at academic feminism, which I've been doing for a few years and now I'm doing more intensively, it's there from the very beginning that the not only the binary division between male, you know, bad, oppressive, privileged and female, good, virtuous, helpless and innocent, but it's there between it's 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 created in a racial framework. It's there in terms of one's sexual identity. It's there in terms of religious expression. It's there in terms of different kinds of ethnicity. It, that, that that love of dividing the world up into these various binary oppositions and the deference paid to the so-called victimized side of that binary was there from the 1970s on. It just didn't right. percolate out into the wider society with quite the, the, the you know, all-encompassing force that we now see in the religion of woke. But anyway, so that's... Um, We've been yeah. slowly <laughs> degraded. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the, 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 the mania for seeing the world in terms of those binary oppositions, it was clearly there from the earliest days. And we're now just seeing the impact of it, I think, you know, many decades later in the wider culture. But anyway, I, I'd love you to talk a little bit about, because I thought you did an amazing job, even though you said, you know, I'm not a moral philosopher, but you did a really nice job of encapsulating in your talk, the distinction between what most of us would clearly recognize as part of natural morality or common sense morality, traditional morality, and the new social morality that has taken hold so powerfully in, amongst the elites and in the culture at large. Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely uh, the central part of my thesis, really. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Just before I get into that, I agree what, with what you're saying in terms of um, the, the the divide and conquer strategy it's the oldest it's the oldest strategy in the book and it's the one that's been deployed by feminists and their forebears right fr right from the start and um, as you say in your latest 
Fia Mango file 2.0, Janice. It's uh, <laughs> right right back to 1848 and probably before that even. The, the, yes. the division into in-groups and out-groups was there. So divide and conquer has been used all the way. Yes, um, the social morality, which is the term I use, it's, I use it to distinguish between um, the, the accepted norms that may prevail in, in a culture and what I would call the absolute or natural or true morality. Now, I confess at this point I have a, a philosophical position that there is such a thing as uh, an absolute or true or natural morality, um, which is not in my case based on a religious perspective. It's just that's, I believe that purely is a philo philosophical position. Um, many people who do espouse that view do come at it um, from a religious perspective and, and pretty much everything I have to say about morality would align with the Christian view mm -hmm. of morality. But and the that, Catholics, the Catholics talk about natural law, right, uh, uh, as something that absolutely. is there for us to be to, to perceive yeah. even outside of a religious framework. Yeah, that's right. And like like the religious axis and particularly the Catholic axis, um, my my view of morality is it's deontological, not consequential if we want to get into heavy duty moral philosophizing. In other words, um, a moral principles originate from some transcendent origin hmm. um, rather than from um, an analysis of consequences. So utilitarianism, for example, is a consequentialist philosophy. Um, but I don't go along with that. I think actually utilitarianism is a form of moral corruption in my, my view. Um, so I'm, I, 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 I should say I'm an atheist. Um, but I'm an atheist who, through the arguments that I'm presenting, um, through socio-political analysis, has arrived at <laughs> an awkward position that religion is pretty much socially essential. Uh, so I don't know where that personally leaves me except in a, a bit of a pickle. But anyway, leave my personal problems aside. Um, yeah. Get, yeah, the, the social morality then, um, it, it, it does not necessarily align with this, take, taking it as read, there is such a thing as, as an absolute or true morality, um, whatever that is. Um, the, the social morality does not necessarily align with it because it's an agreed set of norms. And you know, you know it must be to some extent variable from one culture to another because different cultures have slightly different moralities they tend to have common common elements like you know no no decent society thinks that going around murdering people is going to be right. um, acceptable except maybe in certain circumstances <laughs> um such as if you um you know offend against their religion or something of that sort but yeah <laughs> but this is where the nuances come in so the the, the there are different there are differences um between cultures so there is there is um, a social morality which can differ from the absolute morality um, and which is mutable. That's the important thing. It can be changed because it isn't um, aligned with an absolute morality. Um, and it will, it will tend to change if a society does not have a moral anchor. And this is, this is what I was alluded to in terms of the, the benefits of having a religion and one dominant religion across an entire nation because the religion will then invariably act as a moral anchor yes. and I would argue it's better to have a moral anchor even if as it were the port in which they anchor you is not the optimal one because otherwise you're adrift on the moral ocean huh. and my thesis is once you're adrift on the moral ocean that gives the um, bad actors the opportunity to uh, deflect your moral sense 
in the direction which suits their purpose. And that, I suppose, is in a nutshell my theory of moral usurpation. If you, if you, if you throw away your moral anchor by becoming a predominantly atheist society, which I think is probably true of the UK, certainly Christianity is now a minority um, in the UK, um, then, then you're vulnerable to this moral drift. Um, and if, if, if you're vulnerable to a drift, even a slight current will push you in that direction. Yes. So, so somebody who's determined to massage your moral sense in a particular way can make use of that. And that's what moral usurpation is. Yes. And yeah, so, so then the details of the theory is where the, the five steps, I mean, you could probably break it down in a number of ways, but the way I found it convenient to break it down was in terms of moral infantilism, moral vampirism, the creation of zealots, the appeal to the elites and the creation of positive feedbacks. Mm -hmm. Now, before we get into that, Rick, I want to just uh, interrupt you for a second and say that um, I, there was another point you made earlier, it, it, I mean, that you made in your talk uh, that I forgot to, to prompt you about, and that was that, um, but it comes in here because you're talking about uh, a society that's adrift without a moral anchor, which opens the, essentially there's a moral vacuum in right. the society, it makes right. it possible for bad actors, those who want power, to be able to take control over people by exerting their particular version of a kind of secular religion, the social morality that you talk about. And you made the point that I think is so important that one of the things that the elites want clearly is the, to control men, to make men docile, easily managed, essentially socially you know, powerless, impotent, uh, and therefore, um, well, perfect for their purposes of, of uh, exercising power over them. And so that's obviously you make that point that that's one way in which feminism and all of it, its tentacles, its wokeism have been very, very useful to the elites. Uh, but I wonder, and before you get into the, the different processes of, of what you call moral usurpation, could you just make the distinction that you made between traditional morality, which you said is founded on two principles, and then social morality, which absolutely perfectly inverts those principles. I thought that was that was really, oh, really yeah. good. Yes, I mean, what I, I, I proposed two um, principles, and I'd, I'd add a third now as well, I think. Um, so the, my first moral principle, a genuine moral principle that I think um, is not not subject to uh, uh, any, um, you know, you, you should not argue with this. And it is that um, the line between good and evil cuts through the heart of every man and woman. I mean, that's almost a quote from Solzhenitsyn. But the sentiment there is essentially that we are all sinners. That's how a Christian would express it. Right. Um, and it's very, I'm never, never sure of my doctrinal position here, but it's very close to the doctrine of original sin. Mm -hmm. But however you want to dress that up in terms of language, what it means is, you know, you must always look to yourself as not being perfect rather than blaming everyone else. So that's the first moral principle. The second one is really very closely related, and that is that you should concentrate on practicing yourself the the virtues and uh, this again is my own particular proclivity is is to um my particular dialect of deontological moral position is 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 virtue morality which is a, a one particular spin on it because it, to my mind if you make a list of virtues, it's almost impossible to consider them as other than virtues and almost impossible to consider their opposites as anything other than, you know, character flaws. Right. So to me, it's it's clear. So you, so the two things are both focused on the on yourself. They're both focused on the individual 
and they're both exhortations to the to the individual to recognize their own shortcomings and to do their best to be better essentially mm. and the the third one that i would now add and mm. we won't go into this now but i think it's very important is and again it's it's very christian it's the doctrine of forgiveness mm. i think forgiveness is an essential attribute of a moral yes. orientation yes and whether that's whether that's conditional upon repentance is a thing a thing even even the christians are in some dispute about but yeah. um <laughs> let's make it conditional upon repentance but but i think uh, forgiveness is what is very much um, mm. not a characteristic of the woke i mean you've only got to see the woke, <laughs> the woke descend as a twitter mob on one of their own that said the wrong word and they've oof, they ripped them apart Yes. There is no forgiveness, and they will, yes. they will they will mine your history of tweets going back to the year dot to f find something to <laughs> hang you. There is no forgiveness whatsoever in yes. your makeup. So that's an important one as well. But it, the main one, though, is is the first one. The line between good and evil cuts through the heart of every man and woman. It immediately you adopt that the whole of identity politics goes out of the window because identity politics precisely draws the line between good and evil between the in group and the out group yeah. that's what it does that's what it is it yeah. is a moral corruption right from the very very start exactly yeah. mm -hmm. yes so we, what we have is we've got over the 70 years or 50 years from 1970 we've got the lessening of the anchor the moral anchor and the gradual movement towards lack of virtue and away from traditional values away from morals and this is what feminism has done and of course the elites want that because they can control men through that so they fund everything you said the WEF funded feminism. Of course, we know that Rockefellers funded them. All these people funded feminism with millions upon millions of dollars. So to me, that's just mm -hmm. the big picture that you're drawing here is, is this mm -hmm. gradual, gradual pollution of our moral container, you know, over years. And now people are stuck in this attitude that, you know, the right thing is, is what a moral person would go, no, that's not the right thing at all, you mm -hmm. know. But yeah. the real danger is we're failing to morally educate the young. Yes. And, yes. and I, I, this is a real danger. It's something that I, I, I was brought up in the church, which and I, I've only appreciated that fact quite recently, that oh. I had a very strong moral training uh, when, I, when I was young. And of course, by the time I got to 13, I discovered I knew everything. And uh, <laughs> Oh, that God too. didn't exist, you know. And, and <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I've never fully appreciated until recent years when I've been thinking more seriously about these, these problems and the moral aspect of it that mm -hmm. I benefited a great deal from that moral training. And, and I, I, do, I do think young people these days are being, we, well, we know they're being done a hell of a disservice in terms of their general education. Yeah. Yes. That, that, that yes. extends to morality as well. Yes. It's a mm -hmm. horrible, terrifying yes. thing. Yeah, they're, they're, not, that, they're not taught any kind of individual morality unless they're explicitly involved in, in religious communities, which, as you say, fewer and fewer are. And uh, they are taught this social morality, right. which ironically um, leeches away, well, it, it, it appropriates the specific morals moral virtues that used to be applied to the individual and it says yes we need empathy we need uh strong moral conscience we need concern for the poor uh we need generosity um we need compassion it but it, it applies those only at the social level and it says that in order to create that society that would embody all of those moral virtues, individuals can absolutely dispense with them in their own personal <laughs> conduct and actually should, especially if they belong to one of the 
in groups, the oppressed groups, the groups right. that things are owed to, right. uh, then they can, they don't need to, to practice any of those virtues until this perfect society comes into being. Uh, they can actually manifest all of the very worst sins. But, uh, yes. and because that perfect community will never come into being, uh, they're essentially given a pass on virtue for their entire lives. Whereas other people who fall into the oppress, oppressor categories uh, must constantly um, you know, pay for their sins on uh, a, a society-wide scale by giving yeah. up everything and, and uh, you know, renouncing their, their right to any kind of fair or decent treatment. Uh, so it is really uh, quite a terrifying quite a terrifying vision of human relations that is yes. being taught to young people and manifested in the culture at large, as you say, if, if you look at Twitter and see that as a microcosm of the woke society, it is really a very vicious and bloodthirsty kind of culture. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that, that's absolutely right. I mean, it, it, it's absolutely gobsmacking to me that this, this woke... Um, mindset is preaching that the content of your character doesn't matter i mean it's di directly contrary right. to martin luther king right and as as we know you know what 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 um was then con you know what he would have considered racism is is has been inverted into the opposite and yes uh, it, it, it's it and and it's because you know they don't recognize the content of the character as being important everything is about exactly <clears throat> And, and group membership. And it, yeah. that's so morally corrosive. It's so yes. unbelievable yes. to say it doesn't. And, uh, but this is why it's so appealing to some people. Yes. You give, <coughs> you give them carte blanche to mm -hmm. be as sure. badly Irresponsible. as you wish. Yeah. And I thought one of the most incredible. powerful parts of your presentation was when you said, OK, I'm going to list out some qualities here. Tell me if you think a woke person has any of these. And you listed like 20 different qualities. It was like modesty, charity, compassion, empathy, sincerity, sympathy, spirituality, tolerance, fairness, and on, on, on. Each one, I had to shake my head and say, no, 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 until the end of the list. It was amazing. These people have no sense of virtue, you mm -hmm. know? It's well, because they there. have, in, instead they have, as as you also said, Rick, in the presentation, it, they have this delicious, absolutely exhilarating and seductive sense that they are owed, and they are owed, you know, with all the weight of generations and generations of oppression, which somehow settles on their shoulders, and so they they you know the the, the cultivation of their anger, their sense of betrayal, their resentment above all, and their sense that they are entitled to exact vengeance, really, and to get their compensation. Right. Uh, no know, forgiveness. That, it, it's, it, no, absolutely. No, no forgiveness at right. all. Simply right. compensation without end, to which yep. they, uh, they owe nothing in return whatsoever. No charity. Uh, it, it's a very, very um a very satisfying deeply pleasurable kind of position to occupy and so it's not surprising that many people want a piece of that moral pie <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean it, the whole thing appeals to the the shadow side of the human side exactly it's, it's all coming from there exactly and it, it gives them free reign to exercise the the darkest aspects of character I mean, resentment is the key, the key word there. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so this brings us to, to moral usurpation. This is the key dynamic that you identify yeah. as operating in the feminist project and, you know, all of its right. uh, uh, offspring. Uh, so yeah, maybe you I mean, could... It, it's, it's much wider than feminism. It sort of embraces the whole... The whole caboodle, uh, um, yes. and um, I've listed out a number of number of examples that we might not get there, but it would include COVID nineteen and climate change. I mean, it's ju it's just as applicable to those right. as mm -hmm. um, as anything else. I mean, if you're talking about moral coercion, <laughs> COVID nineteen has got to be the, a preeminent example. <laughs> so yeah, the 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 five the five strands then. 
Uh, let's start with the moral infantilism, because that's that's probably the most important bit. Um, you have to start with something which is a genuine moral position. There has to be a genuine moral core. You don't make things up out of whole cloth. So if you take something like violence against women and girls, there's a genuine moral core there because, you know, yes. violence against women and girls happens and it's bad. You know, right. there you go. Right. Um, so you're going to argue with that, then obviously you're in favour of violence against women and girls, so you're a nasty person. Bad person. And that, that is that, you know, stupidly in, infantile way of presenting it is actually what they do. They present it in that infantile way. There is only one view of it. Yes. And all nuance, all context, all counter arguments, all balance, all relevant empirical facts are nowhere right. compared to, you know, violence against women and girls is bad and they just keep hammering that away. And you have to agree 100% with that narrative, otherwise you're 100% bad. You can't differ by even one tiny bit. Right. And, and that immediately creates in-groups and out-groups just by that process, which yes. is part of the, the point yes. to create in groups and out groups yes. because it's a divide and conquer strategy, ultimately. Exactly. But it's a divide and conquer strategy with their side, the moral usurper's side, defined as being on the moral right. Correct. And that's, that's the process they use with everything. Yes. So that's mm -hmm. the first bit is the moral infantilism and it's the key bit. Um, and of course, it helps if you have a generation of not very well morally educated young people that, right. that are going to fall for it. Right. Um, and you keep key facts from them, of course. I mean, part of the issue here is managing information so that uh, the capture of the media and the capture of the educational establishments are key to making this work. Yes. Because then you can feed them with the infantilized line and make sure that the, the, the other stories are kept away from them. Correct. And if if other stories are in danger of getting to their ears, then you just have to say, oh, well, that's just these men's rights activists that are all a bunch that's of misogynists. It. That's it. So that's the infantilism. Um, the moral vampirism is the overarching um, strategy to capture every peak in the moral landscape. So the vampirism is you want to infantilize everything that can act as a source of moral succor, everything. Huh. So you leave the opposition in moral turpitude so that your side is 100% holy and, and pure right. and the opposition ha hasn't got any legitimacy at all. Yes. And it's what, it's what ended up with the Conservative Party um, in the UK. The, the leader of the party Theresa May at the time actually referred to her own party as the nasty party because that's the image that had been managed to convey and that's, that's what it does. Yeah. Now the, the key thing here is the realisation and this goes back to the importance of the social morality in being a source of control because we are controlled by our if you adopt the social morality that you're adopting you know a self-control consistent with that so that means that if the elites can control what the social morality is then they're controlling you yes mm -hmm. so so it acts as a sort of the, the social morality acts as a source of power that's the point exactly. and this is why i don't know if have you read um um Douglas Murray's book the uh, the madness of crowds mm -hmm. yeah in it he he refers to the the fact that is very familiar to us that um feminists will say oh well women have come a long way but we've got a long way still to go right mm -hmm. and um you, you see this phenomenon in all the all the sort of equality movements and Douglas Murray used a metaphor to say it's as if um, 
we're getting close we're getting close to equality but suddenly we're miles away again and he uses yeah. this metaphor of a train approaching the station and just as it's approaching the station it goes crashing off down the tracks again <laughs> and, he, and he expresses mystification at this but no if you understand moral usurpation right. you know why this is the case because the inequality is a source of Power. moral superiority because if yes. you're somebody that's going to um, ostensibly uphold the rights of these poor in unequal people whether it's women or or gays or trans or whoever it might be blacks or whoever then you're you're occupying that moral high ground right and it acts as a source of power. So the last thing you want is for equality to be achieved. This is why equality will never be achieved. Right. They must always claim it's not been achieved because to say it's been achieved robs them of their power. Right. Mm -hmm. exactly. And I liken it to a battery. Inequality and morality generally is, is like having a fully charged battery. <laughs> if you achieve equality, your battery's gone dead. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Oh, yeah, God. yeah, that, and that is it's that's so important <laughs> to understand because I think we do waste a lot of time sort of being frustrated at the moving of the goalposts and being frustrated at the fact that we now have in universities, for example, about 60 percent of female participation in some universities, actually much higher than that. And in many of the individual faculties, the dominance, <laughs> super dominance of women is just breathtaking to behold, whether you're looking at the education faculty, whether you're looking at social sciences, whether you're looking at health sciences, certainly in arts and humanities, that's been that way for a long time. Only in these few very small disciplines, engineering, and uh, some of the hard sciences, do we still have um, men predominating in those in those uh, disciplines? And yet we still hear that much more must be done for women in these few uh, disciplines. And, um, it, you know, it, it, it just, yeah, it, it's, you begin to feel crazy um, because the narrative is so obviously at odds with reality. Uh, yet, when, once one realizes the whole point is to maintain the position of moral superiority, then it all makes perfect sense. And uh, yeah, I think that's a that's just a, a really good point, a really good way of explaining it. Mm. Just just to follow up on that that tangent about universities and subjects, it's something that I blog on regularly. I I look at the um, the entrance figures every year and. Did you know that in the UK, women dominate as undergraduates in STEM, spelt with mm. two M's, S T E W. Two M's, it's, right. So mm -hmm. science, technology, engineering, maths, and, and medicine and, me and subjects. Medicine. Science and medicine. Yeah. Huh. And they've dominated now for about five years with increasing percentage difference. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's, it's, it, men only dominate, it, actually, women dominate in the pure sciences now. If as long as you include psychology as a science, then women dominate in the in the sciences. So men only now dominate in the UK in technology, engineering, and maths and architecture. Huh. That's all. How about that. Yeah. And the, and the yeah. extent to which women dominate in many subjects is is staggering. So staggering that yeah. even people that read my blog regularly say, "Have you got that right?" Yeah. Sorry, yeah. It's <laughs> like eighty percent. Uh, it's incredible. Yeah, it's, in education, incredible. there's six times more women than men. Mm -hmm. Six times more. In yeah. veterinary science, there's four times more women than men. Yeah. Did and we all, want... the, all these all these female vets want to do small small animal veterinary? Mm -hmm. in, you know, in yeah. other words, pets. They don't want to go sticking <laughs> their arms up the rear end of cows. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did so, we want to sorry, talk just, a little I've, bit? I've lowered the tone now. Sorry. About that's that. all right. Did we want to talk a little bit about what people can do to fight this? Or if you finished yeah, with yeah, the, yeah. you didn't finish with the five. Oh well, there's plenty well, to go at in terms <laughs> of. Um, I've got got through the first two of five. Yet. I think. I think. Yeah, let's... I think if we we can take the creation of zealots as red, can't we? Especially in, yeah. in uh, feminism. But the, the, the appeal to the elites is really important. That's yes. the important one. Yes. Yeah. Is, 
I mean, we've advertised the title is what connects feminism to the global elite. So I best address that one. Yes. Um, the the um, and I can go rather beyond what I said on in the talk. But what I said in the talk and certainly part of it is the appeal of the moral usurpation process to the elites is that it 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 um, gives them a way of atoning for their privileged status and hiding their privileged status behind this smokescreen of right speak because they've the moral usurpation have, crea have created this system whereby in order to be thought of as a lovely person you've just got to say the right words mm -hmm. because you don't have to do anything difficult like practicing <laughs> virtues <laughs> you just have to so use true. the right words oh, that's and that is literally all and if you do that even the most privileged person can present themselves as not only not privileged but even a acquire a mantle of victimhood you yep. even get close heirs to the British throne playing at this bloody game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, when a prince of the realm can come over as, you know, victimized, I mean, yeah. that's how powerful it is. But, yeah. but the, it, yeah. it explains something. Another, another thing that puzzled me, not only things like the WEF, but why is the woke thing so successful in the most elite institutions mm -hmm. because it's the Ivy League it's the Oxford and Cambridge it's Eton and Harrow it's why why are these these you know the 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 pinnacle of educational privilege why is it so strong that well it's precisely that because they have more privilege to distract your attention from so woke is the perfect thing it's the goose that lays the golden eggs for, the, yeah. for these people huh. and the same mm -hmm. goes to the appeal to governments you know because they can pay lip service to feminism and throw them a bone occasionally and um and they, they can come over like they're occupying the moral high ground and the same is true of, i suppose i mean in, in the uk the ministry of justice has gone down the same plug hole and you can see that the same thing applies because traditionally who were the who are the great patriarchs who would now like to distract attention from the fact you might be accused of being, you know, fuddy duddy old patriarchs. Well, they're the judges, aren't they? Huh. Mm -hmm. And and yeah. so they're going to they're going to be woke too, and and the, and many of them now are. Certainly, the MOJ, in the context of the family courts, acts very woke indeed. Mm -hmm. So that's that's part of it. But I can I can add to that now something that uh, I cottoned onto more when I read. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy's book, Wokink. Have you have you come across that? Mm. No, Woke I haven't Inc. read it yet. Um, well, yeah. he's he's um, he's an American and um, he's an entrepreneur. So he's coming very much from. He is a capitalist and an unashamed capitalist. Not, and nothing wrong with that, as far as I'm concerned. But Amen. he's seen how woke works in the corporate world, and that's what the book is about. Huh. Mm. And he coined the phrase the woke. Uh, industrial complex, hmm. um, which I've got my own spin on, um, and and it very much um, really completes the picture on this appeal to the elites, because um, and it comes back to power, of course. All these things come back to power, right. Right. and the way I analyse it is there's there's four different sources of power. Um, there's legislative power or civic power right uh, traditionally in the hands of, of government so that is the ability to make the laws and enforce the laws um, then there's money which is a, a major power um, then there's control of information which mm -hmm. as we know is a very very important power because yeah. that is what will allow you the ability to manipulate the public perception particularly of morality and then right. finally there is morality itself, which is the one that would normally get left out in a catalogue of power, but which I'm now trying to raise up to be a very important power centre. So they're, they're what I call the four instruments of power, mm -hmm. but they're wielded by different groupings in society, different elite groups. And there's three elite groups which you can point to. One is governments, 
and all that stems from government. So national governments, um, local governments, and what they control. So what we call quangos in the UK, quasi-autonomous mm -hmm. national government organisations. Um, mm -hmm. And and what they control, so the police forces and the army and the legislature. So they're one obvious source of, of um, wielders of power. The other wielders of power, the, the corporate axis. Um, but the third um, grouping of power in this triumvirate are what I call the, the intellectual clerisy. And they are the, the media, the education and academia systems and um, and to some extent the the charities that have political alignment. So they they're they're the three groups that wield power, but they all wield different types of power because they all have access to different ones of the four instruments of power. So. So national governments are very strong on the on the civic power and to some extent money as well, but through taxation. Right. The the corporate axis is major on money. They have monetary power, uh, but these days also because of, of big tech, they control a lot a large part of the control of information. So that's another of that their axis of power. But what both those two traditional groups of power are weak on is the moral power and that's mm -hmm. what the intellectual clerisy bring to the party okay right. so they're very strong on the on <laughs> the moral power and they can also generate content for control of information but they're very weak they don't they rely on others for money uh, and they have no they have no le direct legislative power so my my perspective on this is those three groups of power centers trade amongst themselves the different sources of power. Hmm. So, so the intellectual clerisy yeah. are donating hmm. the moral legitimacy <laughs> to the corporate and the, the governmental axes huh. which they crave corporations in particular that's this mm -hmm. is why corporations have gone woke yeah. because they 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 they're using this as because corporations traditionally were the very opposite of moral you know right. they yeah. got attacked right. very strongly on moral grounds yes. you know, you, and you got to look at the petrochemical industry and so on um, so they they crave moral credibility and 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 the governments do too because that's a major part of what gets them elected. Okay, so so the intellectual clerisy are very very key players through the moral axis, and in return they get funded. Right. And in return they can, they big tech will help them control the flow of information that spins mm -hmm. their way. So that's how the whole mm -hmm. thing locks together. It's an yeah. ecosystem. It's an yes. ecosystem yes. of traded power. Yes. And hmm. that is the ultimate, that is the more fundamental, I think, answer to the question, why are these, in, these, these powerful institutions feminist and, and now woke? It's because of that, that system. It's, it's the woke industrial complex. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, that's a very interesting way of explaining it, it as an ecosystem. Yes. Yeah, they all well, get something from the other that they want and they yep. can do it all while <laughs> claiming this very moral high ground. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. Yep. And, and yeah. so it all locks together. All the elites then are in it together and they're mutually self-supporting. And meanwhile, the people who they ostensibly promote through their, their moral, you know, posturing on inequalities are not really helped at all. Right. Mm -hmm. So right. we know feminism doesn't really help women. I mean, it, uh, and it certainly doesn't help the working class. The working class are the ones that are getting trashed. What this really is, simply put, is the latest ruse that the elites have for maintaining their control. Because yeah. the elites have always had a problem. Because the poor old elites, there's not many of them. So how are they <laughs> going to control the vast bulk 
of the masses when it's so transparently bloody obvious to the masses that it's to their disadvantage to be controlled. And this is how it's done. Right. And through the ages, you know, whether it's the divine right of kings or whether it's the moral principle that you should know your place and not step outside it, which that, that was a moral principle as well at one time. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now we've got this system and it's, it's the latest variation on how the elites are keeping the rest of us down so that they can profit themselves. And because of that, because of that, the natural enemy of this whole process is the working class, because they're the ones that always cop for it in the end. Mm -hmm. And the working yeah. class, whether whether it's men or women, whether it's blacks or white, whether it's you know transsexuals or or gays or whoever, it doesn't make any difference. If you're not part of that elite axis, then they're using it against you, matey. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you and they're the using truth. it by dividing people up and thinking that their real enemies are their racial enemies or their gendered enemies or whatever it happens to be, yep. when actually the people who are controlling them and lessening their life possibilities or at least lessening their ability to make decisions for themselves and to recognize who their real allies are, are these these elites exactly i mean it's right. yeah it's you know as you explain it it that's a, i think a really powerful way of analyzing what has gone on and how brilliant it has been as a power move by the elites over the past 30 years or 40 years yes yeah i mean how, whether it's been brilliant or whether it's just naturally evolved yeah. is a moot point i mean there, there will be some movers and shakers who have thought the way through this and the um the critical theorists are probably amongst th those people that have thought the way through it genuinely thought the way through it um but um th th what it really comes down to i think um and I use the analogy of weeds in my garden, I think, in the talk, don't say that the, yes. the only thing you need for weeds to thrive is fertile ground and, and lack of lack of doing any weeding to stop them yourself. Right. Yes. And that, that's really where where we are. If you have a an, a, um, an opportunity for people to profit whilst looking good and having <laughs> very little chance of being made to look bad then yeah. they're going to avail themselves of that opportunity. Yes. And, yeah. and that's, that's, that's mm -hmm. a large, that's probably the large part of it. It's, it's, it's evolved through the natural process of people falling victim to their own selfishness. And yes. the fact that the trash genuine morality only helps in that process as well. Indeed. Definitely. Yeah. Well, so, it, but in that, in that sense, it is, well, I don't know if it's brilliant, but it's, it's, it's more, insidious even than weeds because the the you know the the most uh hardy weed still cannot prevent itself from being plucked up i mean it can regrow but, but <laughs> you know, a, a, a dedicated gardener can go at the weeds and make a difference where it seemed like with this i don't know that it's like something um I don't know, just something almost inevitable, at, at, both at the time and when one looks back at it, it's so difficult to intervene against it. And I watched people attempt to do so and been destroyed. Yes. And, you know, and, you know, even groups, groups that had a, a great deal of understanding of what they were battling and had solidarity amongst themselves, and yet they get somehow marginalized or they're attacked so thoroughly and so relentlessly that they become demoralized. Like it is so difficult to go against this thing. And it was from the very beginning, you know, from the start in the 1970s, uh, well, wherever we want to start it, it was, even if we go back to 1848, there was resistance certainly to the feminist project, but ultimately all resistance often seems to be futile. And that's not a good way to, you know, to, to, to talk, but so, it feels like that. Knowing this, what can we do? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, that, that, that is the million dollar question, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. I have to have to admit that's the weak, the weakest part of my position, but I have been <laughs> given some urgent thought to it over the last week. And I think what I'm bringing to the party here is that is is the centrality of the moral perspective. Yes, and um, so that that would be my first 
position. In fact, I, I, I sketched out some key um, bullet points here. Five principles are written down here. It, the opposition must be morally based. That's number one, yes. because that's that's what they're using against us. So we have to be prepared to um, instigate our own process of counter moral usurpation. Yes. And there may be openings there. There may be openings there. Um, we have to distinguish between policy and methodology is another one. Um, I know, I know both of you, I think, commented on um, Stephen Baskerville's recent piece in, in, in uh, Chronicles. Yes. And he'd, he'd proposed a couple of policy issues there, um, which are fine. Um, I perfectly agree, in perfect agreement with his policy. But what isn't clear to me is how he intends to achieve them. It's all very well saying we've got to make marriage meaningful again and we've got to reintroduce uh, meaningful um, paternity rights and all, all this. Totally agree, but how, how do you achieve it? And so we have to, we have to um, make sure we have some, some mechanism for achieving what we want, want to achieve. And I think that's what we've been rather weak at. And part, part of that is recognising that we're in this for the long haul. Yes. I've never expected things to get much better in my lifetime. Right. This is going to be many decades down the right. road, I think. Yes, but but you know we can kick off in the right direction. So that's the first two, and then um, the other the other thing is attack. We're too defensive. Correct. We've got to start attacking. Yes, right? and I'll give I'll give you an example of that in a minute. But and um, communications is going to be key. I mean, we know. The internet has played a crucial role in what movement we have got, but we know that's in a fragile position because increasingly we're being censored. So we've got to do something about that. And this is where we need people with good IT skills, which I haven't got, to um, to advise how we can get not only secure platforms that won't censor, but also to stop shadow banning because relying on the main search engines to find hmm. things is, is no bloody good uh, right. because they will right. shadow ban. Yes. Um, yeah. So there's a, there's a technical issue there, which I won't say any more about because I'm not competent to do so. But but let let's let's look at the some of those principles. Firstly, the morally based one. Um, we have to learn that empirical facts won't avail us anything in terms of convincing people. Right. Um, that are not already convinced. That's not going to work because yes. to because the the opposition is morally instantiated. You can't attack it with facts. You've got to attack it with with um, um, with with moral issues, and that probably means we don't lead on things like male disadvantages or anti-feminism. They'll have to come along as a consequence, but not lead with them. Mm. So. Um, we do have to promote the moral principles that I outlined earlier, because I think you need to start with that. Yes. And, and there, is, there is some positives here. I think young people are not wholly bad, you know. And they've been horribly misled. But at mm -hmm. least, you know, they have this concept of social justice. It's what they've been told to think it means is so skewed. But, but I think probably in many cases their heart is in the right place yes. if only it can be directed rather better so there is there is some hope there that um we can we we can we can we can work on that and one thing i didn't mention is jonathan Haidt's work um the righteous mind are you familiar with, with no. that yes. mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, you should read it, Tom. It's it like one of those revelatory books for me, because huh. what he does, and this is something he's done with surveys. This is, you know, this is real psychology, Tom. Uh, uh, he, so he and his team has looked into the um, the moral components of political opinion, huh. and so he's, he's looked at the uh, the the liberal axis 
the conservative axis and the libertarian. So there's the three major grouping. So huh. it's all this is all USA stuff. But it, he's um, I don't know whether he's actually done factor analysis, but he must have done something like that because he's he's ended up with six components of morality that are relevant to political opinion. And the absolutely fascinating thing about this is that uh, liberals and libertarians are very strongly polarized onto one or two of those six moral axes. Huh. Whereas conservatives have a balanced view across all six. Wow. <laughs> And in particular, there's, hmm. there's three moral principles, and I'll, I'll probably forget what they are, which are associated solely with conservatism. Huh. And they are, I think they're loyalty, sanctity, and there's one other, I forget. But hmm. they're very much hmm. to do with traditional conservative views. Virtues. Virtues. <laughs> Virtues, yeah. 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 So... But the interesting thing is the liberal liberals are very... And, yeah, liberal, no, specifically liberals are very strongly focused on the care harm axis so, and you know, right, harm being right, the opposite. Of right. So that's what they're that's what they're very, very strongly focused on. Huh. So you can potentially appeal to young people through that initially through that moral dimension. Is this, you know, this has got to be cunningly thought out. How can yes. we get up? Yes. So. You can see what you see how this works in in COVID. They've been working the care harm mm. axis in COVID mm -hmm. like crazy. You know, and no, no. I mean, I said from the start, what this lockdown business is going to create more harm than good. That was yes. Yes. seemed obvious to me obvious. right from April, yes. April 2020. Yes. Yeah. And why were they not doing that? Well, it's because of the inf bloody moral infantilism and mm -hmm. the fact that the left has polarized onto the care harm axis almost entirely huh. so that that's where this is coming from it's entirely consonant with jonathan hyatt's work it's quite fascinating but read you that can, one. If, you, if you're trying to get a window on people's minds that's that's the window that's the door through which you can get you can get into them huh. and, and then ex, then expand hopefully expand their horizons so the the um the two the two views i had in terms of and the approach here then would be, um, uh, well, no, I'll, t I'll, t I'll, t I'll just concentrate on one because it's following that theme. And uh, you might like this, Tom. Positive psychology. Yes, there you go. Positive psychology. Yes. I, I did a double take when I didn't really, I still don't really know much about it, but I did a double take when I realized that one of the key components of that it's what's his name? Sel Seligman. Seligman. Yeah. Isn't yeah. What one of his key issues in positive psychology is practice of the virtues. Practice really? The virtues. Yes. Yeah. I've I listed did not them know out. that. I've listed them out. This is comes from a positive psychology site. Huh. Uh, da, da, da. How me, about that? Yeah. He says positive psychology, the organization of the six virtues into 24 strengths as follows. Wisdom and knowledge, creativity, curiosity, open mindedness, love of learning, perspective, innovation, prudence, courage, bravery, persistence, mm. vitality, zest, humanity, love, kindness, social intelligence, justice, citizenship, fairness, leadership, integrity, excellence, temperance forgiveness and mercy and humility and self-control transcendence appreciation of beauty gratitude hope humor and spirituality i mean i, I could have written this <laughs> that's a great list <laughs> and, and the point is he's saying that if you practice those virtues it will improve your own well-being yes as well as the well-being of society around yes you. i mean yes this is bloody perfect yeah it really is <laughs> yes. that's a good point and, and so this will appeal i think oh, even i think so to the morally undereducated young because this this is the way in to them this is the way to smuggle the virtues into them. <laughs> the virtue smuggler <laughs> that's good i like that because yeah. that's what we need to be thinking about is how can we help people become more um in into virtue you know 
And I think one thing is to start with our own anchor. You know, making sure that we are anchored, making sure that we are following as much virtue as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. And then calling people out, calling things and saying, that's immoral. That's mm -hmm. immoral. And make that argument, put it out there. Because we, you, could, you could say until you're blue in the face, men are 50% uh, of the domestic violence victims. That, that you know, it's not going to go anyplace. But that's immoral what you're doing. That's you're going to have to fight with that. That's, you know? that's it, exactly. It's words are very important. Yes. It took me a long time to realize that, you know. Yeah. My natural milieu is algebra rather than words. <laughs> but what, coming from someone that's written so much. But what yeah. you've <laughs> taught me is that morality needs to be a central core in what we're doing to try and change things. That's and, that is the, my central message. Yes. Sure. And yeah. when we can do that, I think we're on the right path, you know. The only other thing uh, is in terms of attack. I mean, there are many. I love that one. We go, go on the attack. Attack, 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 the, attack baby. Def being defensive is no good. That's not yep. presenting us in the right light at all. Yep. But w one thing we could do in, in the there's probably many things you, you, could, you could adopt in terms of attack. But the one that I favor, and this sounds horribly like MGTOW, but it isn't really. It's, um, it's to set up organizations whose sole purpose is to convey to young people the factual position on relationships, marriage, divorce, separation, child custody, all, all the fact, and you know, who, who's paying and, and extent of fatherlessness, just facts and figures. And so that they know what the position is, because we're doing young men a disservice, allowing them to blunder into um, having children, which they have no secure paternity over. Yes, I, we're allowing them to blunder oh into this. Now, I, I, I don't I don't believe in telling other people what to do, but I do believe that before people get engaged in something that is potentially hazardous, they should be properly trained and informed. Amen to I mean, that. You, don't get, you, you don't go off doing deep sea diving without, you know, just, <laughs> just buy, buy an aqualung and, and dip, jump in, you know. Man, that's the truth. And parenting is a hundred times more important. So we got, to, we got to tell them the position and that would lead to a natural attack. I mean, yes. you can say these are the facts, but f based on these facts, we, we have a... Um, we have a position that, it, um, you know, you may want to adopt. It's ob it's not obligatory, but um, we would adopt a mantra, no marriage, no cohabitation, no babies, yes. until the system changes. Yes. Until we get what Stephen Baskerville was putting forward. No marriage, no cohab, no babies. Indeed. It's a sort, it's a sort of strike position. Yes. And... and and, and my only problem with that strike position is that the people striking are the very people we want to have babies. And well, if we do want they to, don't we have do. babies, then there's not going to be any well, progeny to carry on, you know. I know it's a very difficult message, but the yeah. analogy is with other strikes. People who strike don't strike because they don't want to work. They de very much do want to work. Yes, yes. But, but the only weapon they have is the withholding of their labor. That is the traditional working class position yes. and men are now in that position we, yeah. we have to find a source of power this is what I keep coming back to um, so truth is not power morality is a source of power which is why we've got to leave of that but another source of power is men are still men are still earning most of the money i'll tell you what and men and men have a monopoly on sperm those are those yes. are two sources of power and and we can withhold that by no marriage, no cohab, no babies, until something, because we're going down the tubes anyway, Tom. We are. You know, now, the, I'll tell you we what, don't if, win this battle. We, it's not just that men are going to suffer and not just that children are going to suffer, but the I whole agree. Western civilization is going down the bloody tubes. I agree. And you made me think that if working class men struck, the world would stop, <laughs> you know? And that could have a huge impact on things. Mm. I guess we'll see. We lost Janice. We have lost Janice. I'm not sure exactly where she went. I have a feeling she'll be back momentarily, but uh, I think we're about ready to, to finish up anyway, unless you had more to say, Rick. 
No, I think I've said probably quite enough, probably too much. Did we leave anything out? <laughs> I think we did. There's so much. There's so much that can be said about all this. I, I know Janice would agree when I say, let's have you back. Let's talk again. You know, because there's yeah, a lot be, that we be, can talk be happy about. To. Be happy to. Yeah. yeah. Good. But the final so, message is morality is the key. Yes. I think that is the final message. That and men are good. And also, we're going to leave Rick's uh, a link to his book in the description below. Also, a link to his blog, um, which is an excellent read. You need to go and, and check out his blog. And anything else we need to link you for, Rick? Only, only that the um, the Empathy Gap the book is is now out um, as an ebook. Um, oh, really? Oh yes, oh yes. Oh. It's now an ebook. You mean it's available from Amazon? <laughs> you mean yeah, I can I put this? <laughs> I can put I'm this afraid. aside. <laughs> you, you, you can. You can't. You can't prop up the wobbly chair leg with with an <laughs> It's a hefty that's book. That's the only thing wrong with it. It's it's but a very it is a mint. Price. It's a great it's book. It's a very reasonable price. I think it's probably about six dollars or something. Oh or man, that's that's. Uh, we'll leave a link for that too. But I tell you what, I've found that I like the paperbacks more than the the yeah. ebooks. But uh, who knows? Yeah, Your me mileage too. may vary. <laughs> Indeed. So. Thank you very much, Rick, for your it's, wisdom it's today. Been a, been a delight. Been a it delight. has been a delight. Keep and, up uh, the good work. And, and you too, uh, I do, boss. I, I do like your, your strap line, men are good. I think it's excellent. Yeah, I hope that's an attack. Men actually. are good and, and men are moral. Men are good, men are moral. We'll have to add that one in. <laughs> that's a good thing. All right, so you all take care, and uh, we'll see you next time, Rick. Will do. Men are good, as are you. <laughs>